Madam President, I didn't come to the floor to speak on this matter, but listening to the comments of my friend from Illinois <clears throat> about the contributions made by immigrants to our country, and I will wholeheartedly agree with him about that. Really, uh, when I think about immigration, I think it's really sort of the secret sauce uh, to American success. It's the notion that you can come from anywhere with virtually nothing, and you can legally immigrate to the United States, and that you can begin to get one of those very difficult jobs, working in the fields, working in a meat packing plant or someplace else, and begin your climb toward the American dream. And that's, to me, one of, the, one of the crown jewels of our country. It's what makes us different. You look at other countries around the, around the world, not, they don't welcome immigrants. They shun immigrants. And their economies and their countries suffer for it. So I, let me just say I agree with uh, the senator from Illinois about the contribution of immigrants. And I listened very carefully as a border state senator uh, my state is 40% Hispanic. Um, I'm sure from the center from Nevada has a large Hispanic population. They are part of us. They are part of our great nation and make tremendous contributions. The Hispanics in my state are, are patriots. They volunteer in disproportionate numbers to serve in the military. They work at jobs that are very difficult. They're very tight-knit families. They're people of faith. Uh, they believe in hard work, and most fundamentally, they believe in the American dream. But I don't think it does any, tri any uh, tribute to their contributions or their sacrifices to say that people can come to this country without complying with our laws. And um, I also join in the uh, senator's frustration at our inability to get anything substantially done in this space. But I don't think it's good enough for us to complain about how hard it is. We're all volunteers. What we have to do is do the hard work, and we have not done it since I've been here. We've not done the hard work to try to build that consensus in order to pass meaningful immigration reform. And we need to do that. And uh, it's on us. We can't blame somebody else. We're the ones responsible. We haven't done it, and we need to do it. But I would just point out, and, and the senator from Illinois knows this, that my state has a 1,200-mile border with Mexico. This is ground zero for the humanitarian crisis that's currently appearing at the border. The Biden administration reversed a lot of the policies of the previous administration without having an alternative plan in place. And it was interpreted as laying out the welcome mat for anybody and everybody who wanted to come to the United States. That's why we're seeing these unprecedented numbers, or at least numbers we haven't seen for 20 years, and people trying to stream across the border into the United States. And I know that there's a lot of debate about, well, should we have physical barriers at the border? The truth is, the experts, the Border Patrol, have told all of us that, yes, you have to have physical barriers in some hard-to-control places, but you also need technology and you need boots on the ground. Because this is not just about people immigrating to the United States. This is about the drugs that killed 93,000 Americans last year alone, most of which come across the southern border. Cocaine, meth, fentanyl, heroin, just to name a few. And when we see the current crisis at the border, because of this reversal of the previous administration's policies without any alternative plan in place, this is an open invitation to the cartels to take advantage of the circumstances. And what it means is a practical matter that so many people come across at the same time, which is what is happening now, including tens of thousands of unaccompanied children the Border Patrol, which is the law enforcement officials who are given the mission of securing our border, they have to leave the front line of the border to go change diapers and clean and feed these kids.
because there's simply not enough personnel there in order to handle this flood of humanity. And what happens when they leave the front lines? Well, in one sector, the Border Patrol chief told me 40% of their agents had to leave the front lines, which then was a green light for the drug components, the drug smugglers, to bring the poison that killed 93,000 Americans in the United States last year alone across the border. These criminal organizations are very sophisticated. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly how to exploit the vulnerabilities in our law, which is why they also have understood that if you flood tens of thousands in one month alone, nearly 200,000 people across the border, that you're going to overwhelm the system. And if you coach the migrants to make a claim of credible fear of persecution, that you might just be put into our asylum system, which then has about 1.3, I think, million cases backlogged in our immigration courts, which means we're forced to give you a notice to appear at a future hearing so you can present your case in front of an immigration judge. And maybe, just maybe, you can make your case. As a, fa as a practical matter, only about 10% of the people who do appear in front of an immigration judge are able to meet the legal criteria for asylum. But here's how the cartels, while the, how the transnational criminal organizations have figured out how to exploit our laws. Because we have to release people and give them a notice to appear because of the sheer volume, most of them don't show up for their court hearing. So they've succeeded because of the gaps in our law, not because of a lack of a physical barrier along the border. They're turning themselves in to the Border Patrol and making this claim of asylum because they know that they will more than likely succeed in making their way into the United States. And I don't care how many times the Vice President goes to Central America or talks about root causes of illegal immigration. I don't care how many times that the Director Mayorkas tells Cubans, don't come to America because of the danger of coming overseas in, into our country. These, are, these organizations are smart. They're whispering in the ear of these migrants. They're saying, if you will pay us enough money, we will get you to America. And these migrants watch TV. They watch cable TV. They take phone calls and get emails from their friends and relatives in the United States. They know that this statement that don't try to come to America is just completely inconsistent with what is happening on the ground. So. I don't think it does us any good to complain about how hard our job is or how many times we failed to get the job done. What I'm really concerned about right now is that the majority whip, who's chairman, also chairman of the Judiciary Committee, has basically told us he's going to give up on a bipartisan immigration reform bill and they are going to try to jam this through on a purely party line vote in this reconciliation bill, otherwise known as the reckless tax and spending spree. Now, I don't expect that the parliamentarian will allow them to do that under the rules of the Senate. This would completely circumvent the rules of the Senate, which require on matters of substantive legislation, 60 votes to close off debate, the so-called filibuster rule. But I couldn't resist responding to uh, the majority whips, the senator from Illinois, statements about how hard our job is. I don't think it does us much good to come here and say, this is really hard. This is really hard. Our constituents expect us to fix it, and we know how to do it if we will just do our job. So Madam President, on the bipartisan infrastructure bill now before the Senate, um, I'm glad to see that the Majority Leader Senator Schumer is allowing amendments to be presented from folks on both sides. Senator Schumer had given us an artificial deadline to finish the bill, um, but he's also told us we're not going home 
until we do so and we take him at his word. But I hope he will continue to allow this process to play out no matter how long it takes until this legislation is ready to be voted on. That's principally because the process that brought this bill to the floor did not involve the regular normal hearings and markups across multiple Senate committees. That's certainly not a criticism of the, of the bipartisan group that's gotten us to where we are. It's really just a statement of the dysfunction of the legislative process in the Senate these days. But the fact is the vast majority of the senators in this chamber did not have a hand in crafting this legislation, even though it will impact every single community across the country. I believe the bipartisan group worked in good faith to get us to the starting gate. And now it's time to allow every senator representing every state in the country to weigh in and offer improvements in the bill. I've said from the beginning that an open amendment process is, will be critical to the success of this legislation. And that's especially true when it comes to paying for this legislation. We're waiting for the Congressional Budget Office, the official score, to tell us what the cost will be and whether we've been successful in offering offsetting pay-fors. One budget expert at the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget has already forecasted a discouraging score. He estimated the bill would only raise about $208 billion, less than half of the new spending in the bill. But it's important for all of us to realize we are also reauthorizing the expiring surface transportation bill, which is ordinarily financed by the Highway Trust Fund. And there's going, it's going to require another $118 billion to shore that up because the White House has taken off the table any other pay fors that would include a user fee on electric vehicles or indexing the gas tax or other ideas that would fill in that gap. So another $118 billion of borrowed money is going to be necessary to fill that gap. I don't think any of us regard that as a good outcome. Maybe it's the best we can do under the circumstances. But as it stands now, our debt to GDP, our debt to mar gross domestic product ratio is at the highest level it's been since World War II. In other words, we fought a world war to defeat Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany, and we didn't ask how much it cost, we did what we had to do. We did the same thing when it came to COVID which was a domestic equivalent, I think, of war. Defeating the virus and shoring up our economy. But our country has invested a huge amount of money in the war against COVID-19, and now is not the time to double down on out of control spending for a non-emergency matter. We need to find responsible ways to finance these new expenses, and I hope we'll have an opportunity to vote on a range of amendments to that amendments to that end. I've been proud to work with Senator Padilla, the, our new senator from California, a Democrat, to offer an amendment that would provide more funding for a variety of infrastructure projects, including roads, bridges, and public transit. What it does is it gives state and local leaders more authority when it comes to identifying and investing in the greatest needs of their states and their communities. And here's the kicker. It does so without increasing the deficit one penny. That's because it gives state and local leaders the ability to spend COVID relief funding that they already have on infrastructure projects that might otherwise be neglected. They're not required to do so but our amendment would allow them to do so rather than to claw that money back when the appropriation sunsets or to put guardrails on it and say you can only use it for some prescribed uses, which frankly, they've got more money to spend than they know what to do with when it comes to those authorized uses. As folks hunkered down at their home to slow the spread of the virus and the change in travel patterns hurt more than airlines and hotels, it put a serious dent in state and local transportation budgets in all of our states. 
State departments of transportation are facing an estimated $18 billion in shortfalls through 2024. Leaders across the country have had to delay or cancel critical transportation projects because of a lack of funding, and it's unclear when those projects may get back on track. And I might say, Madam President, that one of the things we've seen with the eviction moratorium expiring is that $46 billion of money we appropriated last year still hasn't gotten to the intended beneficiary, that the people who are trying to pay their rent but can't pay their rent. So we have a huge problem, a logistical problem in voting on money and actually getting it to the intended beneficiary. That's true in COVID-19, it's true in disaster relief. And the type of thing that Senator Padilla and I are suggesting is to take money that's already in the hands of the state and local governments and let them use it so they can do it quickly on investments which will last and endure rather than just spend it on operating expenses. There's an urgent need for more transportation funding and that's exactly what our amendment would provide. There's no mandate, as I said, that it be spent for a single transportation project. But if a city or state or a county has plans to use their funds on pandemic-related expenses, those plans will not be interrupted or called into question. But it simply provides our local leaders what they've asked each of us for most. And it starts with flexibility. If a city is experiencing a spike in COVID cases and needs to use federal funding to, to buy additional ICU bed space or hire new health care workers, they can and they should move forward with those plans. This is not about cutting resources that are needed. But, but we know that many states and localities simply don't have enough qualifying expenses to use the money that they've been given. They're looking for ways to spend the dollars they already have as given to them in the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan. That's not to say they don't want this funding, they just want to be able to use it consistent with the guardrails that Congress has provided. And that's what our amendment will allow. The broad support for this amendment is testament to the importance of these changes. Our amendment's been endorsed by two dozen organizations that represent a diverse range of stakeholders, from the National League of Cities, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the Association of, of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, all of which advocate on behalf of cities across the country. We've also received endorsements from the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, which represents all facets of the transportation construction industry, as well as the American Public Transit Association. It also includes organizations that advocate for safer roads, like the American Traffic Safety Services Association. I've been pleased to find common ground with Senator Padilla and our colleagues on both sides of the aisle to help build support for this amendment and I think actually enhance the work done by the bipartisan negotiating group. This is not something they were able to get done in that negotiating group, they've told me, even though it was a subject of discussion. So now it's a chance for the rest of us on a bipartisan basis to weigh in and make this bill better. Throughout the process, we've made adjustments so stakes with unique but no less important infrastructure needs can put this funding toward those uses. We're in the process of making some final tweaks to ensure that we receive broad bipartisan support as well as that of the White House. And I hope we'll have a vote on this amendment on the Senate floor soon. Our amendment will empower local officials to make the best decisions for their communities and ensure that taxpayers get the most bang for their buck with these relief funds that have already been appropriated and that if we do not authorize their use in the manner I've described, will likely be spent on annual or reoccurring expenses rather than on something that will endure for a long time like infrastructure. So I hope our, amend our vote amendment will come to a vote in the Senate very soon. There's no reason, there's no reason to rush the amendment process and to cut off good amendments for a vote or consideration that will actually improve this legislation. There are a lot of great ideas out there to strengthen this bill, to maximize the impact of every dollar and pay for 
these investments responsibly. So let me just close by saying, Madam President, I appreciate the hard work that's gone into this bill so far, and I hope we'll continue to have more opportunities to improve it as the amendment process goes forward.